Good evening. Hopefully you can hear and see me okay and we'll go live very shortly. Hope some of you have been enjoying the sunshine over the weekend. I haven't been campaigning in a mask. I think uh, my forehead's uh, a lot more tan than the rest of my face. Okay, well, good evening to all of you and thanks very much for uh, joining us on this uh, Dreech Monday night, speaking to you from uh, Dingwall itself. This is our last virtual public meeting. Uh, I can't say leaving the best till last because that might offend all the voters in the other four areas of the constituency, but as a, as a Dingwall resident, uh, I will uh, perhaps uh, think it if I'm not going to say it. It's great even in these times where we can't um, campaign normally to still keep democracy alive and kicking by holding virtual public meetings instead of real in-person public meetings. And it saves on all the setting up and taking things back and stacking chairs afterwards so normally I'd be welcoming you probably to a relatively cold village hall somewhere, but instead we can speak to one another for, from the comfort and the security from of our own living rooms. As I said, I've done four of these already in the four other parts of the constituency. And so this is the last one here in Dingle and they have gone relatively well, apart from the one in Sky where I refreshed my browser and cut off the live stream so I've been learning technical lessons along the way. We asked for questions in advance for these public meetings and uh, I've got some questions for this evening in which have kindly been grouped into themes by somebody else so I've not actually seen the questions properly and um, so they will come as a bit of a surprise. I'll get through as many as I can and aim to finish at uh, 7.45, if not before, because with these virtual public meetings, uh, we do get through more, but um, it's a long time to sit uh, staring at a screen. So we'll try and keep them relatively compact. If you didn't get a chance to ask a question, but would still like to ask a question, or if you feel like one of your questions haven't been answered properly, or you want to leave a comment, then you can do that on the Facebook Live event. So you can just drop a comment in there or a question and uh, I will I will see that um, hopefully and be able to respond to it. Um, and afterwards, of course, if you still have questions or you think there are other issues that we haven't responded to, then please um, send me an email. So picking up emails all the time, although there seems to be an ever increasing number of them, uh, you can email me at uh, Kate Forbes. 2021 at gmail.com. Great. Well, we shall make a start, I think. Well, it's just over a week until the Scottish Parliament elections for the next Holyrood Parliament. And whilst I'm sure a lot of us today have been enjoying our newfound freedoms with businesses reopening finally, a lot hangs on this election and it is one of the most important elections in the Scottish Parliament's history. I know that we've all been through uh, a very difficult and in many cases heartbreaking year. We have faced worries, fears, frustrations, I'm sure. And leadership has never mattered so much. Leadership to make difficult decisions, leadership to make unpopular decisions and leadership to look at the evidence and make the right decision. There is, of course, a lot to be hopeful about as vaccinations remain on track with substantially over half of Scotland's population now vaccinated. And there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And now more than ever, leadership will continue to matter. It is the time for experienced, for trustworthy and for competent leadership to steer our country through recovery. The recovery of the, the Rothschild and Black Isle economy is a top priority for me because 
The pandemic has clearly left countless businesses on their knees. Unemployment has risen and young people are being priced out of housing. And my commitment to the people of Dingwall, the Black Isle, is to tackle each of those challenges in the same way as I have tackled challenges in Dingwall and the Black Isle over the last few years, which is to listen, to be as accessible as possible, and then to work with communities through the ups and the downs until problems are fixed. And doing that, over the course of the last few years, we've made some real progress on difficult issues. It doesn't mean that we have resolved all the issues, but we have made progress on them. And that is the commitment for the next parliamentary term if I am re-elected. But there's a bigger question here at stake as well, because at the heart of this election is about who gets to decide Scotland's future. This election can be the one in which Scotland overwhelmingly and decisively shows that it is choosing a better path for all of our futures. And that means the people of Scotland having a right to decide their future in an independence referendum when the COVID crisis is over. With independence, we'll have a recovery made in Scotland, shaped by people in Scotland and the powers needed to build a fairer and more prosperous country. And of course, it's up to the people of Scotland to make that choice. It's not up to me or any other politician to make that choice. It is up to the people of Scotland to make that choice. And that's why it's important that they have that opportunity to make a choice in an independence referendum. But meantime, there are still questions and concerns about the, the core issues, about our economy and about our infrastructure, about transport, about the environment and about our health and education, just to name a few. And that brings me on quite neatly to the questions, which are grouped into those themes as I have set them out. The economy and infrastructure, transport, environment, and then health. I'm going to take a drink of water. So let's move on to the questions. And a reminder that if you want to ask another question, which um, you don't feel like you had the chance to do, then please uh, pop it into the, the Facebook Live event. So the first question is perhaps one of the most frequently asked questions in all of the town halls, and certainly if my email inbox is anything to go by. And it is about support for small businesses. Now, I know that today is a big day for a lot of Scottish businesses and a lot of Highland businesses the day that uh, non-essential retail can reopen, uh, cafes and restaurants can reopen to an extent and uh, we as consumers and customers uh, can, can leave the house and go and sit and drink a coffee. And ultimately I know that businesses have said from the outset that whatever grants are available nothing compensates for trade. And ultimately, the aim and the ambition of the last few months has been to try and get businesses reopen and trading again as quickly as possible. Now, to do that, we had to work hard to suppress the virus to make sure that it was safe to reopen. But now businesses can reopen. My hope is that they will uh, see a surge in custom and uh, be able to start trading it again. Alongside that, there's two other uh, forms of support that I wanted to mention. The second is, of course, uh, the last grants, so the restart grants, which have been paid out to most small businesses this uh, month. Those were restart grants, which was the equivalent of uh, the, the actual restart grant and two weeks' worth of the Strategic Framework Business Fund. So those should have been paid to Highland businesses, retail, hospitality, leisure uh, businesses in the Highlands over the last few weeks. And then, of course, looking further ahead, there are some sectors that are going to be hit harder for longer. I can think specifically of those businesses that rely on international travel and businesses that perhaps um, are such close contact that they are one of the last things to reopen. And we will keep all of that business support uh, under review. Ultimately, it depends on what funding is available, what uh, finances are available. But our commitment, if re-elected, is to ensure that there is support um, where we can uh, provide it from small businesses. 
I know that small businesses have been through a phenomenally difficult time and uh, look forward to seeing even more businesses reopen over the coming weeks with the next review point on the 17th of May and then the first week of June. Okay, second question. How will you support the regeneration of Highland towns uh, like Dingwall after years of seeing the high street uh, decline? Well, as somebody whose office is on Dingwall High Street, I feel like I see a lot of Dingwall High Street and there's a lot of absolutely brilliant businesses on Dingwall High Street. A new coffee shop that's just opened, which I can heartily recommend. And then, of course, um, the, the, the favourites in terms of uh, D's um, and, and other shops. And on occasion, it looks like it ha it's been quite busy. Obviously, reopening the high street is, is essential. But then secondly, I think there's a lot that we need to do to revitalise the high street. Um, Dingwall and other high streets across the Highlands and Islands. Um, and I think it starts by actually listening to customers and listening to business owners about what they want for their high street. So it's no good people like me or the Highland Council coming in and imposing things on Dingwall High Street. I think it boils down to what do customers want, what would incentivise more people to go to the high street and what would help the businesses on the high street uh, attract uh, more footfall. And building up from there, um, I think there's a lot that we can do. And uh, just in the last budget, we put aside £50 million of uh, funding specifically earmarked for revitalising the high street. So there will be a share for Highland Council. And out of that, there should be a share for Dingwall High Street. So there's some funding there. And then coupled with asking people what they want, um, hopefully we can make some changes and invest in the high street. Obviously, the, uh, the parking has been an issue of debate over the last uh, few years. Um, I've been on record as thinking that we need to draw as many people as possible rather than stop people um, or hinder people from coming. And I think that still remains the case. But we need to make sure that empty buildings can find tenants quickly. And we've got a scheme called the Fresh Start Scheme, which means that your rates are free for a year if you are a tenant if you move in as a tenant of an unoccupied building to try and incentivize uh, tenants to move into some of these empty buildings. And of course, when it comes to, to rates relief, a lot of small businesses will be getting the small business bonus scheme anyway and not paying any rates um, either. OK, next question was on a uh, rural broadband and reaching people after, um, particularly after the pandemic has illustrated how important it is to have um, good broadband. Now, I answer this question with some trepidation because last time I started to answer it, uh, my own broadband started to play up. So here's hoping uh, the broadband will, uh, will last this time round. We, of course, set out our commitment to uh, reaching 100% of properties, reaching 100% of households and of businesses in Scotland. Now, the vast majority, vast majority at about 95% have access to super fast broadband, but clearly in the Highlands and Islands, that figure is much lower. And that's why the Reaching 100% programme was so important to reach that last 15% of the hardest to reach, most expensive areas. And that's backed up with £600 million worth of investment. Now, unfortunately, one of the bidders for that contract took another bidder to court and that has delayed a lot of the, the, the process. Uh, and so unfortunately, it is a delayed commitment. But it's a commitment that still stands. And it goes hand in hand with our commitment to mobile connectivity. So the infill programme where the Scottish government is building phone masts in some of the areas without any mobile connectivity. Rather than waiting for some of the commercial providers, the mobile phone providers, to build those masks, we are doing it ourselves with about £25 million of backing. And a lot of those masks have already gone live. Why does the government allow so many new houses to be built when the existing local infrastructure, especially primary schools and roads, can't cope? Shouldn't developers be making a bigger contribution to such services? Well, I know this has come up particularly in recent years and in the Black Isle, in places like Fertroes, 
where um, the pressure on the roads, even thinking of them in Lochie Junction, the pressure on the roads has increased significantly, but the core infrastructure hasn't actually changed. And uh, in terms of what we should do, Highland Council has reviewed the um, developer contributions that were made, which arguably were too low, particularly if you look at Inverness over the last uh, few years where huge amounts of housing development did not go hand in hand with uh, building new um, schools. So Highland Council um, uh, did um, review that uh, and have um, increased that. And so I absolutely agree with the premise that roads and schools and other things like medical services need to be provided in order to accommodate the increase in housing. And we can't see housing through one lens. But I think there's a bigger issue here too. It's about core infrastructure um, coping or not coping. It's also about creating new communities. So rather than building huge amounts of housing estates with community, no village halls, no churches, no um, core infrastructure binding the whole community together, I think developers need to look very seriously at how you create community rather than just putting houses in random places. So the, there has been a, an increase in contribution um, and there's some parts of the country, uh, some, part of that, some parts of the Highlands, that have seen huge amounts of development and other areas that have seen underdevelopment. And we also need to make sure that when it comes to rural areas, it isn't just the towns um, that get the this new development, it's also some of the outskirts where uh, they need um, to increase the population to reverse depopulation rather than the other way around. Okay, right, we will move on. Uh, and I can see some questions coming in. Okay, next question is around uh, local roads and um, potholes, which is also a firm favourite uh, question. The government blames the council, the council blames the government, who's doing, telling the truth and who's going to fix them? The local roads are dreadful. I was I drove to Rosales last night and um, it felt like I was driving on a, a cheese grater. It was absolutely appalling. Um, partly, I'm sure, because it's been a difficult winter, a cold winter, uh, but the roads are absolutely dreadful. So in terms of who's responsible, the council is responsible for local roads. The government, the Scottish government, is responsible for uh, the main trunk roads, so the A9 um, and uh, some of the other main roads as well. And both or both have a responsibility to those roads, to main maintenance of those roads. So when it comes to um, the Scottish Government roads, Transport Scotland roads, uh, Bayer is responsible. When it comes to local authority roads, it is the uh, it is the responsibility of uh, their, their local contractors or council employees. In terms of funding, things have been challenging for the last year. We lived through a decade of austerity. It has not been easy. The Scottish Government, as far as possible, has tried to protect council finances, uh, but it has been difficult and nobody's disputing that. So the key is to keep those roads maintained and to invest in those roads. And the last uh, budget passed by the Highland Council saw a significant commitment to improving uh, the roads. And that's something I support. 